Hello, and welcome to our training, What Administrators Need to Know About Family Engagement, Part 2. My name is Kim Jenkins, and I'm joined today by some of my colleagues from across the state, Tara Kelly, Lori Chamberlain, Catherine Poggi, and Jennifer Geibel. This training is being recorded and will be posted on the Family Engagement webpage of the Patent website, and it will also be available as part of the Accelerated Learning Professional Development. Links for the Act 48 survey and the Accelerated Learning Code will be provided at the end of the training. If you were, un were unable to join us for part one of this training on April 14th, the recording and handouts will soon be available on the family engagement webpage on the patent website. website. We will be utilizing the chat feature and we encourage you to participate in the activities throughout this presentation. You can also access the captioning via your toolbar. The mission of the Pennsylvania Training and Technical Assistance Network is to support the efforts and the initiatives of the Bureau of Special Education and to build the capacity of local educational agencies to serve students who receive special education services. Here you see Patton's commitment to the least restrictive environment. Our goal for each child is to ensure individualized education program teams begin with the general education setting with the use of supplementary aids and services before considering a more restrictive environment. You might ask, why is family engagement so important? Family engagement is a component that can be found in each of these documents. They contain examples of the necessity of family engagement within the law and standards for education. The Individuals with Disability Act, Education Act requires improving results for students with disabilities. IDEA also requires all states to develop a state performance plan, or SPP. SPP Indicator 8 measures the percentage of parents with a child receiving special education services who report that schools facilitated parent involvement as a means of improving services and results for children with disabilities. ESSA, Pennsylvania's design, is a plan for annual meaning differentiation through a nationally recognized stakeholder engagement effort that include educators, parents and families, policy and policy and community leaders. Pennsylvania's accountability system and schools and school progress reporting will provide educators, parents and families and other stakeholders with clear and meaningful reporting on both school and student group performance, as well as the ability to identify and act upon opportunity gaps. The Danielson framework, domain four, professional responsibilities, component 4C, focuses on communication with families. In order for teachers to demonstrate competence in this area, proactive, frequent, appropriate, and two-way communication with families is paramount in the addition to sharing information about the instructional program and student progress so that families can share in the learning process. The Pennsylvania System for Principal Effectiveness, Domain 4, Professional and Community Leadership, focus, focuses on maximizing parent and community involvement and outreach. The school, leaders, the school leader design structures and processes which result in parent and community engagement, support and ownership for the school. On day one of this training, we looked at the what, the why, the when, and the how of family engagement. We will start today by providing those who were, who were unable to join us with a brief recap of day one. Our first day training was recorded and you will, and if you missed it, we encourage you to go back and watch that recording. Today, we're going to look at the who in family engagement and virtual family engagement. In part one of our training, we looked at the definition for family engagement, the research supporting family engagement and presented strategies to increase family engagement in your LEA. I'd like to ask those who participated in part one of our training to share one thing that either you learned and have implemented or something you will implement from day one. Okay, I see a communication audit, which is good. Effective communication is extremely important when you're building relationships with families. Weekly newsletters. Okay, someone wants to revise their website to build more uh, communication for family engagement. That's very good.
Okay. Again, well, if you weren't able to join us for day one, I hope that you will go back and share, uh, watch the recording because there's a lot of great, great information and useful information that will help you um, expand and improve on your family engagement. I have someone else also said family nights. That's a good way to um, build relationships with your families. Here you can see the definition that we use for family engagement. Family engagement promotes equitable partnerships among schools, families, and communities to actively advance student achievement through shared commitment, decision-making, and responsibility. Family engagement may require a shift in mindset of families, teachers, and administrators. Increasing family engagement at your school starts with you leading the way to work with your staff and families to co-create strategies that work to achieve mutually agreed upon outcomes for children, families, and schools. Children are the priority, change is the reality, and collaboration is definitely the strategy. Research from various studies show the positive effects of family engagement on student success. Students have much to gain by having family members who are active participants in their education. They have more confidence and self-esteem, have better social skills and behavior, and are more likely to graduate and further their education after high school. These students are less likely to need redirection or have behavior issues in the classroom. This research was also presented on day one. It's a framework based on the research completed by Matt and Kuttner showing the relationship between schools and families. As an administrator, you should be aware of this research and understand how to provide support and development for both your staff and your families. Together, schools and families can build effective partnerships that both support and improve student achievement. The components of this framework include, all the way you'll see on the left, we have the challenge. As administrators, you need to be aware of any challenges for both your staff and your families in building effective partnerships in the shared responsibility for student outcomes. By understanding the reason that educators and families have struggled, you will be able to provide support to enhance these relationships. The next box over are essential conditions, and this offers research-based guidance. The policy and program goals section looks at the goals and resources for educators and families, and the capacity outcomes looks at the roles for educators and families that will produce effective partnerships that support student and school improvement. At this time, I'd like to hand this activity over to Jennifer. Hi, everybody. It's great to see you here today. Um, I wanted to introduce a resource that we mentioned last time. So for those of you who were here with us before, we um, introduced this building capacity for family engagement checklist. The purpose of this checklist is to help schools build families capacity for engagement. And it's adapted from a great book, Beyond the Bake Sale, which is written in part by Ann Henderson with a large entourage of people. Um, and they have great ideas for increasing family engagement within LEAs, uh, whatever the layout of your school. So I am going to go ahead and share within the chat a link to this document. So what this link will do for you is it's going to compel you to make a copy of that. That means that then you can save this as your own Google Doc because the purpose of this activity is to look proactively at family engagement. So I realize that all of you are on here because you do have goals and aspirations for family engagement within your school entity, whatever that looks like. This checklist can help you get started on maybe some of the things that you want to work on. As we look forward to next year, it's important to go into the year having already identified, okay, what are our areas of growth that we want to see in family engagement for the next calendar year? So um, I'm going to give you guys a couple seconds to go ahead and find that copy and just put a little message into the chat if you're having trouble pulling that copy up. The reason why we made this a copy is 
we have identified several categories here. So, so first off, we have developing the job description of family members in education. And we have several suggestions as to activities we can do to help families feel more empowered and more in touch with their role in their, their child's education. We also have a second category, building families' confidence in their ability to help their children, and then making sure all families feel welcome. And we have several um, statements underneath that. Okay, sorry, I'm looking at the chat and it seems like a couple of people can't access it. Was anybody able to access it? I'll wait for uh, people to respond to the chat. Okay, yeah, so it looks like people can access it. So probably what you need to do if you are having trouble is you're gonna have to log into a Google account. And if, um, you know, you have trouble logging into Google, this is all gonna be available to you after the training. So um, keep trying. And if you uh, don't have a Google account, we'll make sure this gets out to you. All right, so the reason why we put this up here is we would like you guys to consider your own LEA and your own environment. We have suggestions here as to how to build capacity for family engagement. But we know that there are other ideas out there. So what I'd like you to do is, is take a moment to read through these suggestions that are on this sheet. And, um, you know, Kim, are you able to zoom this in a little more, perhaps for those friends of ours who did not have luck copying the link? Um, we can make it a little bigger so they can read it. So yeah, take a look and you'll notice that on this checklist, we left spaces that say other. Now this is where you can personalize this and make it your own. So I would love to see in the chat some other suggestions as to how you could either one, develop the job description of family members, two, build families confidence in their ability to help their children, or three, make sure all families feel welcome. So I'm just gonna wait till we have some messages in the chat. What could you add to this list? So when I was uh, looking at this, this checklist, I was thinking how important um, this relationship of building capacity for families ended up being last year when the pandemic started. It was always something very important, but um, that was magnified when we had to work so closely with families just to ascertain what kind of education was taking place for our kids, right? So um, I'm interested in seeing what people have to add to this. All right, so some people have added some ideas as to what they would want to include here. Send home video of child's presentation in class. Oh, I, I love that one. So if we're talking about developing the job description of family members, or maybe it would fit better here, building families' confidence in their ability to help their children. If families receive a home video of what a child is doing in class, how much closer are they to understanding their child's education or even just understanding the project itself? You know, we talk many times about the new math, right? It, math is a little different than when we were in school. Um, seeing a home video of what that math looks like can be really helpful to us as parents. I have three children myself and there are times that I don't always understand what they're doing until somebody helps me and somebody shows me. Um, another suggestion here, have a family workshop night to help families learn how they can support their child at home and at school. Awesome idea. So again, building that empowerment of families so, so they feel prepared to help in education. And I would encourage everyone, if you're having a workshop night, also think, could I do this in a virtual way as well? for those family members who can't get there. Um, could I push the information out in another way? Let's see what else we have. Creating a space for family. What an awesome suggestion. Now, I know some of you out there have areas for families within your school. Um, sometimes it's a family resource center. That's fairly popular. Or even just a, a little room where, where families can come in and carve out their own space so they feel as part of the school. Um, that can really help people feel welcome. So looking in that third category, making sure all families feel welcome. It's great if we, if our families feel like they have the home there at the school. Interest surveys, another great idea. And we have a couple areas we could look at. So interest surveys as in um, how families want to be involved, perhaps how they want to volunteer their time, what is most helpful 
for them and being able to assist their kids with homework, um, the communication interest survey, uh, how would they best like to communicate and receive notices from the school, and then tech support for families. Wow, that is another one that ended up being so important for our past years. We started using more and more virtual technology. Did we have the support for our families that they needed? Um, and this could look like a lot of different things, right? Some of our families maybe didn't have internet access at all or the access they had was very slow. So they needed to even troubleshoot what they could do virtually. Whereas other families maybe were looking for more sophisticated help. How do I edit a PDF file? That is not easy um, unless you have been taught how to do that or do it on a regular basis within your work. So another fantastic idea. And I think that would really build families confidence in their ability to help their children. All right, so I think that's all the suggestions we have within our uh, chat right now. Did anybody have anything else they wanted to add as far as those other slots? All right, Kim, I think you can go back to the regular presentation. Guys, keep this checklist as a tool, as a document. If you weren't able to access it, we're certainly going to be including this on the file um, or the folder that we share at the end of the presentation and make it your own. It's always a good idea to work with your family members at your school and get their input so they can help in this decision-making process. What do they want to see added to this? And you know, they will often come up with fantastic ideas that will help you move along your family engagement program. Thank you, Jennifer. I do see in the chat that someone asked about um, having access to these documents. And we will be posting a recording of this video and all the handouts on the family engagement page of the patent website. So um, I know our day one is just a day or so away from being posted and we will work to get this training posted as well. So you will have access to all these documents on the patent training website. And if you are um, watching as part of the accelerated learning um, professional development, those items will also be posted on the PDE's website for your to access there as well. This next section, we'll look at the many stakeholders in family engagement. A family engagement stakeholder is an individual or group with an interest in the success and achievement of a student and maintaining and increase, increasing these achievements over time. Here we see the big picture. And this slide was shared in part one of our training. The information in this graphic was adapted from an engaging stakeholders document that was developed by the United States Department of Education to illustrate the importance of involving families in increasing student, student reading outcomes. However, it really does a nice job of breaking down the stakeholders and family engagement into their constituent groups and describing what's at stake for each in having families centrally involved in their child education. At the top of the pyramid, of course, are students. Having their families involved in their education increases their likelihood of success through school as well as future opportunities. As we know, after the students themselves, families are the next primary stakeholders in their child's education. Being centrally involved allows them to have input into their child's school community, support their success, and increase opportunities for their child both throughout their education and into the future. For teachers, paraprofessionals, related service providers, and other school staff, partnering with families allows them to increase their professional efficacy, better tailor their instruction and services to their students' needs, and enjoy a better sense of collaboration and job satisfaction. As administrators, you stand to gain so much from making family engagement a priority. In addition to enhanced collaboration between school and home, resulting in increased outcomes for your students, you also have the opportunity to develop authentic relationships and partnerships with families who have so much to contribute to enrich your school's culture and community. This can allow all your stakeholders to have a sense of ownership and pride in what's being created and achieved by the students. At a district or LEA level, family engagement provides increased accountability and opportunity for positive media relationships and alignment with mission and vision 
in many instances. For taxpayers, family engagement results in increased student outcomes and higher quality school communities, which help them to feel as though they're getting a good return on investment for their tax dollars. Plus, many families, including grandparents, are taxpayers, so that's a win-win. The business community is in, need, is in need of a well-educated, skilled workforce, so engaging families in their child's education increases the chance of graduating students with the skills they will need for the 21st century workplace and beyond. And finally, family engagement provides the community at large with a sense of confidence and pride in the quality and outcomes of their schools, as well as enhanced real estate values and better sense of quality of life in many cases. In short, there is so much to be gained from making family engagement a central daily part of our practice. On this slide, you'll see stakeholders who may be actively involved with your students. As an administrator, you work closely with your students and staff, but I'm sure that most of you have experienced, have experienced working with advocates, agencies, and possibly community groups. Take a moment to think about people beyond your own staff or agencies that you have worked with related to student achievement. Right now, I'd just like to ask you to please enter um, in the chat other stakeholders you have worked with in the past. Okay, I see foster care agencies coming in, yes. The IU, the IU is a great um, agency to partner with. The intermediate unit offers a lot of resources um, and things that are to you. So you can find a great wealth in, um, in working with the IU and all the, and their expertise and um, their um, resources that they have available to you. So that's very good. Head start for those students, especially those coming in from early intervention. I see community members, business owners, legislatures, board of directors, colleges and universities, yes. How many times do you have um, student teachers coming into your building for both general ed and special ed and um, giving them you know, a, a very good experience, um, which in, should include working with and how to best work with families, physicians and medical professionals, specialists and physicians, children and youth. Yes, thank you so much for um, posting information in the, in the chat. Sororities, oh, that's one I hadn't thought of, but very good. Yeah, and I'm sure that um, you know, through the colleges, you can find other groups that, um, to work with as well, mentoring programs. Again, thank you for posting so many good responses in the chat, college tutors. Very good. There are many, many people um, that you can work with um, to help support student education. Okay, now let's look at the IEP team. And first, let's start with the definition of team. A team is a collection of people who come together to work towards a common goal. A team works within a set of defined norms with linked roles and responsibilities. The focus of the IEP team is the student, and the goals of the IEP team are focused on the achievement and well being of the student. On this slide, we see the required members of the IEP team. The student is required at age 14, but we will share a little bit more information later about involving students in the IEP um, process much at a much earlier age. We have the parent and guardian, the special education teacher, and the general education teacher. Um, and the LEA representative. And then there we have the bullet that says someone who will interpret the student's assessment. And this could be one of the other roles listed above. It could be a teacher, an administrator, school psychologist, or somebody else. And then we have at the bottom, the last bullet is others who support student success. And that could come from a grand resource, a grand list of resources and, and agencies and that are there. So in this slide, we can break our stakeholders into three groups. We have families, schools, and community members. And all three groups want what's best for our students. They want them to succeed. Now, families is a generic term for anyone who helps raise a child. It, is used, it used to mean biological, adoptive, and foster parents, but it could also include grandparents, 
older siblings, extended family members, community members, or others who may have custodial or supervisory rights over a child. But families also include children, our students for whom all this work and our careers are dedicated. Today, we're going to take a deep dive into the student as a stakeholder. Catherine will start us off in this next section, student voice. Thanks so much, Kim. And I love the tie-ins that you linked in when we talk about stakeholders. Student voice is definitely one that we want to platform. Uh, the content area that I'm going to talk about today is connected to a local school district. It is Indiana Area School District that has been really progressive and creative with their multi-tiered systems of support from both an academic lens and also from a behavioral lens. They are doing positive behavior interventions and supports. And one of the tenants that we see when we look at what we call PBIS, the wonderful acronym that is linked with that, is that when families are connected to the school and we're looking at the non-academic barriers to have those schools be a healthy, resilient location, our youth thrive. And what they've been able to do is take that message and really purposefully engage with their families and their parents and their different stakeholders that are supporting those youth and letting the youth be an ambassador. So this school district was kind enough to give us a video clip and uh, a little student testimonial that we think that you all will be able to relate to and see the great things that can happen. So Kim, if you wouldn't mind just advancing over, thank you so much. We find that the strengths that come from family engagement connect to all parties. So we look at that from the broad spectrum that our youth are going to be better partners and participants in the classroom. They're going to be better and more readily able to absorb the content and engage with their teachers. We're going to see a reduction in behavioral acting out or some of the challenges that may happen. So from an administrative lens, but really what I love is the social emotional component. Our youth will be able to be better citizens, better partners within their entire school and their local community with their peers and to be a role model for younger children that are looking to that. So I think we're ready for the next slide. And with that, again, I would love to give the credit to Indiana Area School District that was kind enough to share this Flip. There are many school districts that are doing amazing things. And I know it's the patent system. We are always celebrating that. And this is a team that was able to sit down and really capture from a youth voice how these connections have not only had the families feel more connected, but also it's circled back that the schools and the parents are really having joint partnership to see their students be successful. So if we could launch the video. Thank you so much. Hello, my name is Anna Margita and I am a junior here at Indiana Area Senior High School. I am the Vice President of the Ambassadors Club. And as an ambassador, we are the first faces that the new students see coming into this school. Um, we're the first contact that they have. Um, we always want to welcome them into our community and make them feel like they have a new home. Hi, my name is Jason Zhang. I'm a senior here at IHS, and I serve as the treasurer for our Student Ambassador Program. Our Student Ambassador Program here welcomes new students by making them feel welcome. And by doing so, it helps their parents feel that their child is safe here in a learning environment where they can thrive and just be themselves. Personally, I've had the experience of meeting a new student's parents. My last tour, I gave a, the student a new tour and their parent, and I just knew, like, that parent felt way more comfortable with the school knowing that their kid was in a safe place where they can learn and thrive. The ambassador program is great for new students and is great for us too. I've gotten an opportunity to meet one of my best friends and now we have welcomed another family into the Indiana community. Hi, my name is Sydney Bryce and I'm a part of Leadership Seminar. And my name is Allie Rutledge and I am also a member of Leadership Seminar. Leadership here at IHS is a student-led organization. We're here to serve as a role model, and we come from all organizations across our school. We go above and beyond of what is expected as students. 
One of our biggest events of the year is our annual mini-thon where we get the entire school and the families around the community to come together and fight pediatric cancer. We invite all families of IHS, business owners around our community, and all students to join us on the night of mini-thon. Due to COVID-19, last year we did not get the opportunity to have a mini-thon, but this year we are so excited to bring our IHS community together. Whether this be in person or virtual, we are so excited to hold our annual mini-thon. Okay, uh, hi, uh, I'm Hassan. Uh, I'm in IHS leadership and as a part of that, I'm in the student district planning committee. Um, I think the way I've connected with parents the most is through that committee and the committee meetings we have. Um, because, you know, especially during COVID times, it's hard to have in-person meetings to exchange perspectives and ideas. But in those district planning committee meetings, I can put myself in the shoes of a parent and see, okay, this is how they see the issues of the district. These are the problems they're facing. These are the solutions they have. And, you know, that's a perspective that I wouldn't have on my own. But in that committee, by discussing, you know, those items with parents and, and teachers and school district members, um, I can sort of see from, I can sort of see from their eyes and see what's going on from their perspective. And I think that's the, the greatest value that that committee has brought. Excellent. So thank you, Kim. We were so glad that we were able to spotlight this team during today's session. And we're hoping that that will give you some inspiration, either from an administrative level or from the other stakeholders that are with us today to go back. If you're not formally partnered and doing some family reach out from a multi-tiered perspective, positive behavior support is a wonderful inroad. We celebrate the students and we celebrate the students bringing those youth into the building and inviting their parents to join in from everyone looking at a commonality around safety, responsibility, and being welcoming with respect. So Kim, thank you so much for this little segment and I'm gonna pass the baton back. Thanks, Catherine. Now we're moving from a students involved at a school level um, doing wonderful things to help support their community, their learning community. And we're going to bring it down to focus a little bit more narrow now and look at student led meetings. And I'd like to pass the baton over to Jennifer. Thank you, Kim. So we're going to be talking about two different types of student led meetings today. One is student led IEP meetings. So this will concentrate more on how students are involved in their own special education programming, but then we'll also be talking about student-led meetings um, kind of more across the board as far as individual students, whether enrolled in special education or not, becoming involved in what used to be called parent-teacher conferences, um, but taking a more active role in that. All right, so we'll go to our first slide. So first up, we have a quote, and this is just to help you think about the direction that we're going in. Personalized learning is not what is done to the learner or about tailoring the learning. It is about helping each learner to identify and develop the skills they need to support and enhance their own learning so that agency and self-advocacy can be realized. Now, self-advocacy is something we'd like to see for all of our students. We speak about it quite often in the realm of special education, but every student should feel the power to be actively involved as a learner within their own education. In this section, we're going to talk about the importance of encouraging students to become active learners by realizing their own strengths and exploring their needs. Uh, we'll talk about those two types of student-led meetings, student-led IEPs and student-led conferences. And throughout this section, we're going to consider how such meetings can increase the independence of all students, both with and without disabilities. Let's move forward, great. Okay, so we're actually going to start out this section talking about student-led IEPs. Now, IEP meetings or individualized education program meetings are something that has to take place annually for students involved in special education. And the reason why we're beginning here, instead of on uh, the more general uh, course of all children, 
is that there's probably been more work in the area of student-led IEPs than general student-led conferences. Um, this is something that we've been researching for a number of years as, as we've been determining how best to increase self-advocacy for students who are enrolled in special education. What student-led IEPs are, are meaningful opportunities for students to serve as active participants in developing and achieving that IEP plan that they have when they're involved in special education. These meetings provide students with the opportunity to explore their strengths and their areas of challenge and to understand them better and also to share their perspective on what they need to learn. Students can participate in their IEP meetings in a variety of ways, perhaps by presenting the present level section or determining specially designed instruction or by leading the entire IEP meeting themselves. LEAs who are interested in increasing student voice should really consider using student-led IEPs as a viable option to um, create student engagement in special education. So I was curious at this point as to whether anyone on the line had ever engaged any of their students within student-led IEPs. So if you could just put a quick message in the chat, if this was something you tried, yes or no, and then maybe how you did it. Um, did your students get involved in presenting at their own meetings, presenting present levels? Did they talk about their goals? Okay, so I'm just gonna wait till, for people to respond. So we're getting no's from most people, and that is not uncommon, so don't feel uncomfortable or anything. We did have one individual say, no, we have preschoolers. Um, so I think a preschool involved in their own student IEP meeting would absolutely be adorable. Um, and I will encourage you as, as we go through to think about uh, the ages of students that you want to involve in, in their own IEPs. It's according to the law that we have to include 14 year olds and older within their IEP. They have to be an invited member, but you can actually start this process much, much earlier. So for a preschooler, this process might look more like maybe identifying the things they like to do or how do they want to keep track of something. Um, there are ways of answering uh, these questions, even for very small children. So don't be afraid to think outside the box on it. And we do have one, a couple people responding. I'm just gonna go through the chat. Um, it looks like you guys have students who are even just contributing their feelings. What did they like about the past year? Um, sometimes they just introduce the team. They explain the SDIs that they use. Um, oh, they interviewed their own teachers for teacher input and led the IEP meeting. I love that, interviewing their own teachers. That really puts things in perspective, doesn't it, as to who this meeting is for, right? It's for me. Um, and I've never heard anyone do that before, so that's awesome. Um, oh, created a PowerPoint because the student was nervous to speak. Yes, always um, able to adapt these activities. Students in the middle school are invited to the meeting. They share what they see working for the team, created an agenda with student points of view to review at the meeting and had a wonderful result. That's phenomenal. Um, oh, presented accommodation preferences at a 504 meeting. Yes, this is absolutely something that could also be done with your students who have a 504 plan. And then we also have a message here, students help draft their SDIs. SDIs can be a fantastic place to start because SDRs are how students achieve success, right? They're the strategies that they use to make things happen. And that's wonderful if they can draft those. Uh, thanks so much for sharing everyone. We can move forward to the next slide. So many wonderful ideas. So why do we want to get involved in student-led IEPs? Because I'm sure a lot of you are thinking this process could be complicated and, and it can be. I'm not going to say there's not a learning curve here. There absolutely is, but they, are far surpassed by the number of benefits associated with student-led IEP meetings, such as increased student engagement and accountability for educational goals. By actively participating in IEP meetings, students enhance their knowledge about their own abilities, as well as the accommodations that can increase their success. These students typically exhibit greater levels of employment and graduation following their school career. And they also have increased achievement of overall post-secondary goals. Students who participate in their own IEP meetings also exhibit positive, 
positive acceptance of who they are, of their abilities and their disabilities, and reduce that stigma that can be associated with having a disability. They feel more comfortable asking for what they need and advocating for their own needs, which is important because when these students move forward to adulthood, there will no longer be a school advocating for their needs. It's that um, idea that whereas when they get to, to adulthood, they are eligible for services, but the services are not required. They really need to go seek them out. So the more they participate in these meetings, the more confident they feel to do that. Additionally, we are here today to talk about family engagement. And the truth is that families are more engaged in IEP meetings when their students, their children are actively involved in them because it really shines the light on who this meeting is for. The meetings themselves generally are more inclusive and positive when students participate in their own meetings. Um, they, the students themselves have increased levels of confidence and independence that can carry them through school and the rest of their lives. So consider sharing these benefits with your staff members. Ask your staff to reflect upon ways that they've included students within their IEP. Maybe they are doing things that, that you guys are not even aware of at this time. And think about whether you can identify further benefits or, or further strategies to student engagement within the IEP process. All right, so some considerations for student-led IEPs. Well, a couple of you guys mentioned earlier in the chat, you've got very young students, so how do we engage them within their IEP meetings? Well, we of course have to consider their age and their abilities, uh, the way they communicate, for example, how they demonstrate decisions, how they express themselves. These are all factors that we have to look at, but youth in itself does not preclude students from actively participating in their own IEP meetings, even if those participations are very facilitated by us or um, you know, seem very small given the young age of some of our students. Even very, very young students and students with really complex needs can admirably participate within their own IEP meetings. But we do have to consider those best options for how they'll do it. So think about some questions. What roles will the student take during the meeting? What sections of the IEP will the student present? Maybe we just pick one to start with. How will professionals teach the students the meaning of the IEP? And this is a big one. So we can't only be thinking about what our students need to do. We have to think about what do our teachers, our educators, um, our related service providers need to do to directly instruct the students in what they need, how they need to be prepared for their meeting. It is likely that the student will benefit from direct instruction to both understand the purpose of the IEP meeting as well as to take an active role in the presentation of the content. So teams will need to consider what kind of instruction is necessary and who will provide it. Team members should also expect and should be expected to welcome students as equal partners in education and to facilitate the success of the student-led IEP by effectively explaining content in terms that the student will understand. So this is one of those things that IEP is a word we probably use on a daily basis, um, an acronym that we use quite often, but not everyone understands that. Sometimes families don't necessarily grasp it. So how are we teaching our families and our students what this really means in ways in which they understand? Um, additionally, team members, especially you guys, educational administrators, you should initiate practices in which the student is acknowledged and validated for their participation within the IEP process. So this would, could be something really nerve wracking for students to be involved in, right? We're always kind of nervous when we get in at a meeting if we haven't done this uh, in our lives before, it's something new. So we really want to create a positive atmosphere in which students feel confident about their contributions to their own education. And I'm going to take a, a look at the chat because I do see that some people are, are conversing. Um, and one person mentioned, even though they're young, IEP meetings can still have a takeaway for young students. And that's absolutely true. Even just having the student there, the student attendance alone will impact the meeting. And so Vanessa also talks about language. Sometimes the language we use is to advance for even families, even parents. So sometimes students force the discussion to be family friendly. 
because we are explaining in ways they understand. What an awesome point, Vanessa. And then we have a, uh, a question here. How can we as preschools and teachers at preschools become a part of an IEP meeting? We often do not know they are happening. What a really good question, Leslie. Um, and that's probably not a problem we can tackle here today at this particular training, but it does really underline the importance of communication. Uh, typically when we have meetings, IEP meetings, even at preschool level, uh, there does have to be a an educator signing off on the IEP. So I'll give you an example. Um, I'm a speech language pathologist. So even when I was presenting an IEP, with, which was more oriented towards speech and language, I had to get someone who was an educator, like regular, edu regular education person to sign off on that. Um, and we didn't always get the people that were in the classroom with the student. So perhaps we need to talk about collaboratively how we can engage the preschool teachers to participate in those meetings. I imagine that time could be a barrier to that, but now that we are so much more used to using virtual means, it might be possible to involve a lot more members of the team. So if you would like to contact me about that later, I could give you some suggestions about that. My email address is gonna be on the last slide because it, it's probably gonna be a different answer for every LEA we work with. All right, thank you so much. I'm gonna to move to the next slide. So here's some examples of how students can participate in the IEP meetings. This could look different for every student within every LEA. <laughs> so there are many, many different things we can do. This is only part of it. Every student being different is going to be involved in their own IEP meeting in different ways. So here are some examples. Students could prepare and send invitations, conduct introductions of the team. Um, often they might be the only people that know everybody on the team. They could make a presentation that could be about any part of the IEP, whether it's the present levels, the SDIs, the goals. Um, they can communicate their strengths and needs. Talk about their own accommodations and modifications. Now here's a big one that any of your kids can engage in even if they're preschool. They can define future goals and dreams. So it's that what do you wanna be when you grow up type scenario, or even what do you don't wanna be when you grow up? Or what do you love? What do you like? Um, where don't you ever see yourself working? Whatever that looks like for the age group that you're, you're addressing. They can write sections of the IEP, if that's something that is within their um, ability, and facilitate the IEP meeting or even just part of it. Uh, there are so, so many ways, and I'm sure I could have made this list 10 times as long, but um, consider your students' own abilities and how they can participate in their IEP meetings by individualizing participation based on the students' strengths, needs, and their preferences. I love that someone said, that their student really didn't want to talk out loud, so they did a PowerPoint. Perfectly valid in the world we live in, right? To use technology to support us. What a wonderful way we respected and validated that student's preferences. Now you guys as administrators will need to be available to discuss student involvement with your staff members and troubleshoot ideas about how to best promote student independence. Um, so be prepared to have those hard conversations with staff members as far as what are the expectations for getting our students involved within their own meetings and what are the many ways that we can define involvement. All right, so moving a little away from student-led conferences, or from student-led IEPs, we're going to talk in general about student-led conferences. So student-led conferences are similar to student-led IEPs, but instead they mirror what we would think of as traditional parent-teacher conferences for students participating in regular education programs. That was the moniker when we were children, probably, parent-teacher conferences. Many LEAs hold parent-teacher conferences either quarterly or at the beginning or the end of the school year. Uh, schools often do this differently. Um, these conferences customarily consist of a family member and a teacher and traditionally do not include any student input of any kind whatsoever. Um, this would be aside from something perhaps the teacher has collected to bring to the student 
or the parent teacher conference examples of the, the child's work or something like that. However, we're going to put a different spin on these with student led conferences. Student led conferences is uh, taking that concept that we talked about in student led IEPs and applying it to the general education setting. It's a reframing, if you will, of your parent teacher conferences as student led conferences in which students present pertinent information within their meetings. So these meetings can be a time of celebration recognizing all the accomplishments that the students have achieved. But it can also give you an opportunity to address ongoing academic and behavioral concerns with the student right there and able to contribute their own unique perspective. Just like with student-led IEPs, student accountability is increased when kids are permitted and even encouraged to have a seat at the table. There's also that bonus that holding student-led conferences in that they intend to also increase family engagement in conferences. So I'll give you an example of this. This may seem like a silly metaphor, but if you want families to go to a concert, put their kids in the orchestra, right? Typically families don't go to the school concert if they don't have kids performing in some way. When families know that their students, their children, the people they love and are devoted to are going to be involved in those student-led conferences, they are much more likely to attend them. Families are definitely more apt also to meaningfully contribute to the meetings that feature their own child. So rather than being those passive parties that listen to the educators, they're more likely to share their views if their student, their child's also invited to share their views. All right, so it looks here like some of you are already doing student-led conferences. Um, this school, uh, Ty has shared, they do student-led conferences from pre-K to eighth grade, wonderful. And it stated that this is a great way for students to reflect on their strengths and areas of growth. Definitely a way to increase motivation and accountability for students, that's fantastic. Has anybody else tried any student-led conferences? It doesn't look like it's, it's leaping out at us right now, but keep adding to the chat. I'm so interested in hearing your ideas. All right, we're going to move forward to our next slide. Thanks everyone for all your contributions. So how do we prepare staff members to participate in student meetings, whatever they are? Um, it's quite common if not likely, for staff members to be utterly unfamiliar with the concept of student-led meetings, whether they're student-led IEPs or student-led conferences. So therefore, pro providing training to classroom teachers, special education teachers, related service providers, paraprofessionals, basically anyone who might take an active role in the IEP or student academic process is paramount for success. Um, you as administrators, as you move forward to next year, I know you're at the point now where you're looking at all of your in-services. You're putting together your list for next year. And this is usually where it becomes overwhelming. Oh, we have to cover so many things. But it might be a good idea to include something like this. If this is a direction you wanna go in, preparing staff members to participate in student meetings, include some training for them in some way. So they can even start thinking about uh, student involvement as the norm rather than a luxury. Um, there are trainings that may be available through Padden or your intermediate unit on these subjects. And you might also find some great resources at I'm Determined. I'm Determined is a site that has done a lot of work with student-led IEP meetings and has some really great supportive documents for you as you move forward through your journey. Um, hello, everyone. I am going to be talking about COVID and virtual instruction considerations along with my colleague, Tara Kelly. So to say that this year has been difficult is really an understatement for everyone, um, especially in education. We have learned a lot. I'm going to highlight some important lessons that we have learned during this pandemic in order to uh, give you some good takeaways that hopefully we can continue as we move on um, and apply to future 
years. So some of the challenges I know that we face during um, with virtual instruction might be expectations, um, student enrollment, equity, tech issues, and we're going to be tackling a lot of these today. But I wanted to start off by saying probably the number one lesson that I learned and many other educators have learned is the um, is the um, importance of partnering with families to educate. So we know that educators and families have to work together and need to work together to ensure learning will occur. But this was especially true with the COVID-19 pandemic and going virtual. So I would say as a result, we have as educators realized that partnering, partnering with families is important but we also learned how beautiful it could be um, when we do partner with families and the benefits for our learners and for our students. Uh, let's start off with talking about digital communication and knowing your audience. So this, the idea of stakeholders was discussed previously uh, in this presentation. And I just want to emphasize the importance of knowing who your audience is when you are communicating with your audience. We all realize that education staff, families, and students are part of our audience, but we forget many times that it includes grandparents, foster families, um, alumni, future students, community members, neighbors, fans that support your teams, financial con contributors, and taxpayers. So in order to be effective in our communication um, and partnership with uh, families, we all need to work together to achieve the goal of education. And so now let's talk about how some of the variables that we came across when the pandemic first, um, first hit us. So these are some of the, the variables that we had to consider, we, you can consider them obstacles, but um, perhaps if we, if we look at these, um, we could see maybe the silver lining here. So how do we deal with um, being, having to work from home, 24-7 um, care of our children, education of our children in the home, as well as doing our job and educating families and um, other children and doing our jobs. So basically these variables, um, where we have to consider them when we are um, implementing virtual instruction and the families we serve have a lot going on in their home. But at the same time when COVID hit, we had a lot going on in our home and we had to learn how to balance all of these variables too. And I think that we um, in the process of considering these variables can find common ground. And this is a nice um, foundation or building building point of, of empathy and mutual respect for the families that we serve. So we need to consider working from home 24 seven care of children, education of children in the home, children with disabilities and without and resources and technology. So as a result of, of looking at these variables, um, the Patent Autism Initiative created a virtual instruction checklist, which I think is beneficial for all educators, not just for the um, educating those with special needs. So we created this assessment to help us just get started and considering multiple variables of, of doing virtual instruction. So you can, um, I think someone's gonna provide the link for this for this planning sheet in the chat box. But if when you get the PowerPoint, you can click on continue, continuity, continuity for educational planning sheet and it will, it will lead you to this worksheet um, or this planning sheet. But basically it's looking at considerations of the contact with the family. How are you gonna make contact? Household circumstances, caregiver availability, um, focusing on family needs, time availability, device specification, internet access and software access, audio visual um, tech stuff, all of these things that we never had to consider before, now we had to consider. And so creating this checklist, I think, and then getting that information is very helpful so that we can provide support to the families that we serve. Um, and instead of seeing these as limitations, we can look at these challenges. And, and when we consider these variables, we can um, make sure that we're educating our learners effectively. Um, so the next slide is just page two of this same planning sheet. 
And so looking at student considerations, how will the student respond to technology? Do they have problem behaviors, teacher considerations, um, session considerations? How are you going to do the instruction? Um, parent training needs and material considerations. So all these is based, all this checklist is for is to give you a starting point on where um, our families are and how best we can serve them. Um, all right, so this led, uh, after we looked at all those variables and that planning sheet, then we can kind of start to make an educational plan. And one of the, the first, other lessons we learned is because there is a lot going on in the home environment for all of us, um, we had to shift our attention and our goals and how to provide meaningful education and um, in the context of the home. So what does this look like? Now we were used to providing education in the context of the school environment. Now we're providing virtual instruction in the context of the home. And how can we do that? So we, it, it requires a goal shift or a shift in, in um, what we need to do to, to partner with families to provide structure, help the families provide structure, help them with a schedule. If they have multiple um, children in the home, how can we help get um, all the children involved in activities? Uh, maybe do chores and daily living skills and embed our math instruction, our reading instruction, language into these natural environment kind of activities. So um, it really required a kind of a goal shift. Instead of doing maybe morning meeting, we're looking at, well, how do we embed math instruction into cooking breakfast, right? And, and, and different things like that, that we could help families schedule and structure the day um, around their needs as well and kind of look at individualizing that instruction. And another important piece is um, using reinforcement um, effectively. A lot of families maybe didn't know about reinforcement or how to use reinforcement effectively. And so getting their child to come to the computer and sit for periods of time and use reinforcement effectively is another important consideration. And so this handout was created to share with families. Again, um, we created it with the Autism Initiative, but I think it's beneficial for any student and any family um, that is embarking on virtual instruction and changing the um, instruction from the content of the school building to the home environment. All right, so uh, those of you who don't have a Google account, um, I think you can still access those through the Patent website because these are offered through Patent. All right, now I'm going to shift over to Tara and she's gonna be talking about the communication piece, how to communicate effectively with families. Thanks so much, Lori. And these are really great resources that you shared. I can say as somebody who spent a lot of time working in early intervention, we know that anytime we can embed learning activities into the natural routines of a family's daily life is going to increase that likelihood that they happen with regularity. And that really does still apply for older students too. So opportunities for authentic practice are gold. Um, we absolutely love that. So moving on, the next couple of slides were actually introduced in part one of our training, and um, we feel it's good to reflect back on them because their importance really can't be overstated. And uh, communication, as we know, is the foundation of all relationships, and that includes, obviously, the relationships between families and schools. And as administrators, we know that we need to model this, and we really need to emphasize that importance for our staff. Um, but before we get to that, I want to take a second to you just take a quick pulse of our group and ask you what are some of the ways that you're currently communicating with your families and which ones seem to be working the best for you and your families if you could go ahead and just share your responses in the chat i just think it's always great to see what everybody's doing and what's working well okay i'm seeing dojo class dojo yep facebook and twitter remind emails texts and calls yep Doing, doing a little bit of everything, community meetups. Fantastic, I would love to know more about that. One call, apps and websites, newsletters, constant contact, Skylert. Ooh, that's one I haven't heard of yet. I'm excited to look that up afterwards. Zoom and Google Meet. Yeah, I feel like I live on Zoom and Google Meet, Mary Beth. Instagram, Twitter, yep, lots more social media these days, absolutely. One call, yep, another great one. 
weekly messages. Yeah, having a timeline for when communications go out, I think is really important. It's great to keep things organized when you can. Well, thank you so much, everybody, for your feedback on that. There were some really terrific suggestions in the chat, and I'm always excited to learn more about some of the apps and tools that folks are using. I'm a bit of a techie in my spare time when it comes to ed tech, so um, that's always some exciting stuff. But I think one of the important things that I'm taking away from what's being put into the chat is that you know there's really no one-size-fits-all method. So there's a lot of different approaches that are being used, and depending upon your school and your family's needs, um, you're really going to need to tailor the approach. So that being said, you know, we always want to be implementing open and ongoing communication because that's really the crucial step to building an atmosphere of mutual respect. And we do need to use a variety of ways to accomplish that. Um, so we know that digital communication and digital resources, and you're all highlighting some of the really terrific ones, um, that is a great way to reach out to a lot of our families. But we also know that not all of our families have access to the internet and particularly high speed speed internet. Um, not all of our families have access to computers um, or even devices in some instances. So it is really necessary that we think through um, different ways that we can provide information and also that we ensure that whatever information we are providing in a digital format can be easily accessed um, through a mobile device. And even though it seems like it could be a contradiction to our previous statement that highlights the importance of frequent and ongoing communication, in our zest to be transparent and to have this wonderful open communication, we also want to resist the temptation to inundate families um, with unnecessary information. Um, we know that not every school communication is going to apply to all of our families, right? Um, so generally, it's a good idea to work with our tech departments and our tech teams to ensure that our families are only only getting the communications that they need. Um, mostly because if we overwhelm them with information, um, some of our families may eventually start ignoring our messages because they just feel like we're constantly spamming them with email and texts and um, flyers and other things that are coming home. So for example, um, it might be useful for all of our families to know that our school's year-end event um, is going to be taking place on Wednesday night, June 2nd, and that all families are invited to that. But it might not be useful for all families to know that the choir trip has been canceled. Maybe only the families whose students are involved with choir need to know that information. Um, so it's also important to remember that, you know, families are busy just like we are, right? Uh, they're juggling a million things at any given time. And they are far more likely to read shorter amounts of information, you know, while they're juggling, you know, trying to find the car keys and getting kids to the car or trying to look up the bus schedule and trying to make sure everybody's packed and ready to go. So if we can say something in 10 words instead of 200, then that is usually going to be our best bet. So we need to be um, very economical with our word choices when we can be. Um, when presenting information, we want to ensure that it is always available in the languages that are used in our school community. And to assist with this as administrators, we want to be mindful that we are providing training and support to our teachers and staff on how to use the translation tools and apps, some of which you all just mentioned, um, have actually embedded translation features, which are great. Um, and then in terms of making sure that we have quality translation and interpretation services available, especially for important meetings like I IEPs, like the more formal meetings and events that happen in our school communities, we might want to look at joining translation and interpretation consortiums, which can allow us to obtain services that are really high quality at a less expensive rate. Um, and we also need to be mindful of the fact that when we talk about interpreting services, that also includes providing access to sign language interpreters at both school events and private meetings. And we also need to be reviewing our websites and any digitally provided information to make sure that they um, meet the WCAG accessibility standards or the web accessibility standards. That means that they can be read with a screen reader, that they have um, fonts available that are easily read and have high contrast. Um, all of these things that would make it easier for folks who have visual needs um, to be able to access the information. And finally, perhaps the most important element of communication is really the attitude that we put forth when we're communicating. We want to make sure that we are expressing, you know, the utmost emphasis on building a positive rapport and that we're maintaining respectful and courteous interactions. And we really want to make sure that we show in everything we do that we value the family's input and their experiences and that we're not just ticking a box by the communications that we're putting out there. 
Okay, next slide. Okay, so then we wanna take a look at what does it mean to have a welcoming website? So when we're looking at our website, we know that many times these days, you know, most folks are conducting a lot of life online and our website might even be one of the first things that they learn about our school or our district. So we really wanna to seek to engage families from their very first view of our homepage. It should be very clean and user-friendly, easy to navigate. We want it to express our school's mission and vision and our priority goals. Um, so when people, we ask people, you know, what do you think the mission or vision of our school is, they should be able to answer us based on what's available on our website. It should really demonstrate a commitment to family engagement. And I've always felt that a good litmus test for this is, does our website just talk about family engagement or does it actually provide avenues for families to be actively engaged? And that could involve things like having email and other communication opt-ins that pop up and are readily available to families on the website. Does it include easily found links to social media and resources? Are there readily available um, updates and information about the upcoming events and opportunities, any important dates that families need to know? So um, those are just some of the ways that instead of just talking about family engagement, we can really be about family engagement with our websites. Um, we always want to make sure to include a parent's or family's page or section of our websites. I would always say try to err on the side of a family's page. It tends to be a little bit more of an inclusive option since we know that some of our students don't live with their parents and families can be however students choose to define them. Um, so that's usually a better option than saying a parent's page. Um, we want to really celebrate the diversity of our stakeholders in our photographs and make sure that, you know, when possible, if we have photo releases, let's be using the families in our school community and the pictures of our families and them partaking in school events. If we have photo releases for our students, being able to document the things that our students are achieving and doing in our school community, always a wonderful way to feature that on our website when possible. And then portraying a variety of the educational activities that we have. Um, I know that many school districts are extremely proud of their sports programs, and that's a wonderful thing to be proud of. Um, but we should absolutely be seeing a variety of activities on the website. Um, be proud of our sports programs and feature all of the wonderful accomplishments, but also make sure we're featuring a lot of our STEAM activities, our arts, our science, technology, and engineering, and math pursuits, um, our drama, um, anything that is community service oriented, all of the other wonderful activities our students might be partaking in, um, any of our school clubs, um, all of those types of things. And then finally, we wanna make sure that our website is inclusive of everyone, including our um, families and stakeholders who have disabilities. So we need to make sure that it is ADA compliant and that it is accessible by individuals who are blind or have low vision, individuals who are deaf, hard of hearing or deaf blind, and maybe navigating the web page with a screen reader. And then also if we have any media posted on our web page, that media should always be captioned. All righty, next slide. So looking at some considerations for digital communication. So we know that digital communication is ever evolving and it, you know, it seems like overnight things are always changing, right? I know just in the list of apps that were shared in the chat by you know, next week, a couple of months from now, there will be even newer apps that are out there, um, which is exciting, but also it can be a little bit daunting because it gives us a lot to stay on top of. Um, so we wanna make sure that when we are considering the needs of the folks within our LEAs, um, we are are really being mindful about all of the different pieces as we go through things. So the first thing we need to look at are, you know, the needs of our school district itself. And we want to know how many of our families have access to digital communication. What is the availability of internet access like within our school community? If lots of our families do not have internet access, are there community resources available that we can get them connected with to be able to get them that access and to be able to get them online. Um, we can use surveys to accomplish this, but we should also be, you know, finding ways of doing that through key communicators in our school community. We should be finding ways of doing that um, both digitally, you know, that's device accessible, but then also through traditional methods for families that may not have any digital access whatsoever, not even through devices. Um, personal phone calls home is another way of doing that. 
Then in addition to internet availability, we also need to look at internet speed. Um, and that's really useful if we're thinking about starting to do some activities that or events that have live streaming embedded within, um, because usually you're gonna be looking at needing to have internet of at least uh, 200 megabits per second. Um, and other considerations is going to be equipment. Um, we know that many times if families have devices, they may be shared devices. It might not be that in a family, everybody has their own. Um, so we might need to look at how can we get families connected with tablets or laptops that can support participation in online learning um, and other opportunities from home. And then will smartphone access be sufficient for certain things? Um, and we know with some of the apps that were just mentioned like Seesaw, Remind, Class Dojo, all of those are very mobile device friendly. Um, but again, it's not enough just to ask whether a family has a device. We need to really think through how our device is going to be used, when are they going to be used, and then how many will really be needed in order to have meaningful participation supported. And that meaningful piece is really uh, is really the caveat because it's not enough to just say, oh yeah, you know, somebody was able to log in, so they participated. We really want to make sure that they're getting something out of it, and it's really a benefit added. And then also that they're there's a dialogue that's able to happen with that. And again, this is really important in families where there's multiple children, especially because if there's multiple children having to use the same internet connection all at once, and if a student needs to be able to be visually present during an activity or needs to present something, that's another consideration. So we really need to think through that. Um, so the final consideration for all of this is that as much as we depend upon technology and as wonderful as it can be, as we have all learned too many times this year, unfortunately, sometimes technology does not work. And when that happens, um, we need to have, you know, the plan, the backup plan for what are we going to do when these things happen. Um, so whether it is sending things home in a paper format or using a, you know, phone tree type system or a call blasting system, um, we need to have something available so when, you know, either text is not available or email may not be available, we have a backup plan for how we are getting crucial communications out to our families. Okay, and now we come to our action steps for digital communication. So we know that there are several action steps that we as administrators can work on with our teams when we're putting into place norms for digital communication. So the first thing we need to do is take a look at the policies and procedures that we have regarding technology. And you know, a lot of times this may come from our district and then perhaps we may have some additional add-ons um, for our schools. And we want to look at what modes of digital communication are available in our school. And again, you know, you all put some really wonderful options into the chat. And then what guidelines do our teachers and staff have? What do they need to be following when they're using those digital communication methods? And have we as administrators ensured that these expectations have been clearly communicated and understood by our staff? What type of information do we want to disseminate in digital ways and what impact is that going to have um, on education and on our communication plans with our families? Um, even issues like cybersecurity and platform costs need to factor into our digital communication guidelines and planning. And then while internet access and equipment are important, the familiarity with digital communication platforms and our family's ability to support their kids through the use of technology cannot be and I cannot be overstated. We really need to make sure that we have a clear cut way of helping families with this, because as we know, we have to meet families where they're at in all things and our mileage may vary. Some families may be very internet and tech savvy and other families, this may be you know very new to them. So we really need to be looking at how we can best support everyone. And one way that we can accomplish this is by providing training and support at school events. And tech trainings can be easily incorporated as part of family game nights or STEAM fairs at school. Those are two really easy examples of how you could incorporate that. The training could um, should be addressing useful topics like how to access the education portal or platform that's used by your school, um, how they can be accessing grades and homework for their child, as well as any tools that are being regularly used by their child as part of their learning in their classroom especially if that's something we're going to ask them to be able to do at home as well. Um, if we're referring families to any sort of an online tutorial, 
Um, we need to be very specific about that. We need to be providing them with the actual link to the tutorial rather than just suggesting that they go look at it because they may have a hard time finding it themselves. Um, and again, we want to prepare families for digital communications before we use them whenever that's possible. So if we are referencing a teleconferencing platform like Google Meet or Zoom, um, or if, for example, this past year with COVID, um, for students who have IEPs, many of our IEP meetings had to move to an online format over a platform like Zoom. So if we know that we're having an IEP meeting on Zoom, we're going to want to send families some tips and a checklist for how to have a meeting on Zoom. We can't just assume that they already know. Um, and that way, if we do that ahead of time, then we might be able to help troubleshoot some of those things before the day the meeting actually arrives. So that being said, now I'm going to turn things back over to Lori, and she is going to take us through considerations for planning virtual instruction. Thank you, Tara. So we, I kind of started talking off, uh, talk, I, I started text and those difficulties and how to consider general plan. And then Tara went over the technology needs, availability and use. And Tara also talked about instructional materials, kind of availability and use. So how can we provide these things? We have, we, had to be, we have to be creative. We can give out computers, we can mail materials, we can also meet and train caregivers and coach them and how to instruct their um, students when the students had a hard time, have a hard time um, coming to the computer. Uh, so these are some of the things that we can do for those first three steps. And now I'm going to be talking about the child's level of functioning, uh, skill level in the home environment. If the child isn't independent, how much support does the child need? And is that support available at home? So let's look at this next slide here. Um, and so uh, one of the things that we need to consider is the higher the risk level for um, the learner, the higher level of the support we need to provide the family. Also, the higher the risk level for the family, the more support we need to provide. Um, during COVID, one of the things that we noticed was basically all the variables that are going on in the home environment. Um, yes, I know even during COVID, it was even more um, restrictive uh, with, with you know, lack of reinforcers, strain of, on the effectiveness of the reinforcers that we all had during um, COVID time. And so helping families and individuals provide and for their families' educational needs was, uh, was definitely a challenge. And so this is just kind of a reminder to say, hey, if the student is verbally interactive, we're able to provide virtual instruction, individual sessions, maybe remotely share the computer with the child. But if, our, if the student is um, minimally vocal or more preschool age, um, the virtual instruction is more of a challenge. And so then we move more into a parent coaching type system. And uh, so the level of need kind of guides us in determining how to interact virtually, not on what we can do, but on what the student needs. Um, is to um, kind of have these takeaways, right? When we are looking at virtual instruction and when we're looking at what we learned during COVID, um, we learned to value the role of the family and how important it is to maintain a positive relationship with families and to partner with them in education uh, settings and to educate their child. Um, and so some ways we can do that is we can teach the parents or teach families on evidence-based interventions that work. We can teach parents to um, help their children reach their per full potential by partnering, partnering with them and realizing the difficulties that they're going through and make common goals that we can all work on together. Um, parents have the most time with their children and they are motivated to provide for their children the best that they can. And so we have to work hard to ensure that we are partnering with families and teaching them and how to make a difference in their child's life. And so we, um, when we're restructuring goals, we can't do the same old thing and expect 
in a different context and expect the same result. We learned that we had to work with parents on scheduling, um, teach, teach families how to structure their day, embed instruction into more natural environment kind of um, um, activities. And we had to we have to teach uh, parents and families how to use reinforcement, how to structure reinforcement around uh, performing tasks and making them naturally embedded into activities, maybe using a reinforcer menu based on what is in each room of the house or an activity-based reinforcement system where you do an activity together and then, um, um, then the child does a preferred activity um, on their own. So these are some ideas and some ways to teach parents how to use uh, reinforcement and how to uh, partner with families in virtual instruction. The higher the risk level, the higher the level of support. And it's just so important to realize that we need to base the level of support um, for the families we serve based on the needs. And I think most everyone knows that, but I think that's one of the biggest um, things that we also learn from COVID. And when we're providing virtual instruction, um, we need to make sure that we're providing for the needs of the families and the students. Okay, so now let's look at resources for virtual learning. And so um, the next slide that is going to come up. These are video links. What the tech are we doing? Coaching families and virtual in instruction for learners. These are video links that will be very helpful for you in teaching your staff and how to um, provide virtual instruction. So the first, first research, um, the first one up here, what the tech are we doing? This resource provides valuable information on how to collaborate and work as a team. So it's um, for teachers, administrators, families and students and other staff. The teachers, um, Bruno and Lishak are uh, provide information on like what they did in the midst of the pandemic and the important considerations of how to train staff, fidelity checklists, how to provide consistent implementation and how to continue implementation when you're on site um, in, the, in the building, then you go virtual and then you go back in the building and you go virtual, which I think we all experienced this year many times. Um, the teachers also in this presentation talk about some organizational systems and the importance and usefulness of data, not just to take data, but data that will um, show the effectiveness of teaching. And if it isn't, if our interventions and teaching is not effective, the data will show that and then we can change what we're doing. Um, uh, the importance of providing a schedule for the staff, even when we're doing virtual instruction. So the schedule for the staff would say what is going on um, what are we teaching, who's teaching it, and how are we going to tie this to data, as well as um, what curriculum and procedures are we going to use. Those things are important pieces of any schedule that we need to implement in any classroom. Um, the, other, the other important consideration for any schedule is that it needs to be flexible. Yes, we can have our set schedule, but every day something different happens, especially during a pandemic. And so we need to make sure that we have our schedules, but then we have flexibility um, built into them. And so there's some ways to do that that they talk about in their training. Um, family engagement training and collaboration is so important. And um, the teachers in What the Tech Are We Doing talk about how to be honest and transparent. And that really helps build relationship and build rapport with, with the families that we um, serve. Now, the next video here on coaching families, this is um, a presentation by the Harrisburg school team, and they provide a nice model videos on how to coach families, basically take you step by step through the process. And so it is a very great resource in, um, in coaching, providing coaching tips and how to set up um, coaching families to educate their learners. So basically in the video too, they show you um, the teachers are watching instruction going on and then they um, provide feedback to the parents and, and help the parents um, improve in their techniques. Um, then the last video here, the last resource is virtual instruction for early learners. So a lot of us 
are like, how do we provide instruction for those learners that just won't come to the computer? And this instruction, um, I mean, this resource is provided by some teachers and um, teams that they provide detailed information on how to work with families that have children with limited skills. They suggest meeting with the families, revising IEPs, listening and collaborating with families, um, talking about how to use a duration of time and a schedule that is feasible, not just for the learner, but for the families that we're working with. And basically they say, start where you can, provide training and coaching for families through webinars, in-session coaching, daily office hours, and asynchronous activities. So those are all great tips and that's a great resource that I hope you'll find very valuable as you're instructing your teachers and your teams and how to provide virtual instruction. And the next slide then, um, again, this is how to support students with disabilities, part one, two, and three on this slide. These are, are great uh, resources for um, teams and educators and also parents. Like I would provide these resources to any parent with a, with a child with a disability. It really um, was well done by Amira Stapuglia and, and gives very practical, helpful tips and how to, um, how to um, work with children that have special needs. And then the last um, resource here on this slide, the learner is always right, instructional design practices for individuals with autism. I just wanna provide the caveat that it says um, instructional design practices for individuals with autism, but these are instructional design practices um, for any individual, not just individuals with autism. These principles that are presented by Andrew, Dr. Andrew Bulla in this presentation um, would help with any good instructional design practices and teaching concepts. And um, so those are some videos that I hope you find very helpful. And now I would like to just go over a couple, couple, couple of publications that are provided on the Patton website. Um, the first one uh, that I'm gonna go over a little bit, um, basically I'm not gonna read it to you, but I just want you to know you can find this on the Patent website, but also I think someone might provide links in the chat room. But these are lessons learned from virtual learning during COVID-19. Um, and I think that um, you might find this useful to, to uh, print off and have available for your team and uh, go over some of these these practical considerations. And then the next two resources I already went over. These are the checklist for virtual instruction. I just um, have it here again for you. And um, I think you'll find that very helpful when you're planning virtual instruction, what kind of considerations and, and how to make your educational plan. So it's feasible, not only for um, the educators, but the families that you serve. And now I'm going to hand it back to Tara. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, Lori. Um, so what we'd like to do now is just take a minute to highlight a couple of resources that might be especially helpful for you to share with your families. So the first thing we have is the um, link to the patent website. Um, and this is the family engagement section of our website. And I actually just dropped the link in the chat. So you'll find lots of great information here, including the page that has specific resources to share with families. And you can kind of navigate through the tabs, um, but there's lots of different um, pieces of information. There's some training modules available. Um, there's also, um, you know, we're constantly updating the publications pieces and any of the other opportunities that are available. So um, you're always welcome uh, to check in there and see the things that are being refreshed um, under that section of the website. The next piece is going to be um, two resources that we'd like to highlight that are specifically geared toward assisting families with virtual learning. And that's the lessons learned from virtual learning during COVID-19 and then the helping your child learn at home. And I will put the links to both of those into the chat.
And again, as you'll notice, um, both of these are very easy to read. Um, they're written in a you know nice sort of um, cheat sheet bulleted style. So um, lots of really kind of um, high impact, but low density information so that families are able to get what they need and sort of get on with their day. Um, nothing that's too um, lengthy or extensive. And then finally, this resource was created by the Center for Dignity and Healthcare for People with Disabilities. It is available in both English and Spanish. And this actually features a social story about getting the COVID-19 vaccine. Um, so I'll put the link to this one in the chat. And now I'm actually going to turn things back over to Kim and she will start looking at what we have learned. Thank you, Tara. So we've presented a great deal of information across um, both parts of this presentation um, last month and today. But what are some of the things we've learned along the way? The impact of COVID was felt by everyone. Those in education face barriers just like everyone else. Um, this time has been a time of adaptation, modification, and learning. And there are positive things that we've learned along the way. Turning a moment into a movement, how the COVID-19 pandemic is jumpstarting a new era in family engagement, was written by Ann Henderson February 8th of this year and offers some encouraging information. As an administrator, I'm sure you know that families have been struggling to manage their children's remote, hybrid, and in-person learning. They struggle as they try to master the technology of connecting to a virtual classroom and ac accessing learning materials for their children. They're wor worried that their kids are falling behind and not getting enough instructional support. Many families are looking for connections with their children's teachers and schools. And many teachers are also struggling with challenges and barriers faced during the past year and additional challenges as everyone looks to coming back to the in-person classroom. Your role as an administrator is to lead by example and provide the needed support for both your staff and families. Although this has been a difficult time, some positives related to family engagement have been occurring. Schools are a vital resource and connection point for families, especially now. During the past year, year LEAs have helped families meet their needs by providing meals, learning materials, computers, and digital access. Family li liaisons are checking in with their families to ask if they're okay. Technology is paving the way for easier two-way communication between teachers and families. Educators and families have learned how to use different platforms to share information and collaborate in supporting children's learning and development. Teachers and families are problem solving together and coming up with innovative ways to stay in touch. Virtual parent-teacher conferences and IEP meetings have been adopted by schools. Many teachers report that they feel better connecting to students' families and are able to develop strong partnerships in educating students. A great example of this was in the video we shared in part one of this training. Jamie was a mother who shared how she worked with her son's school to assist in his learning. If you missed part one, I encourage you to go back and watch this video recording. Parents are coming forward and being recognized as leaders. With experience and networks, parents are helping school staff with outreach and community building. Parent leaders can provide guidance to others in the community who need assistance. They can be the bridge between the school and community. Administrators, educators, families, and communities can all play an important part in the education of our students. You take the lead you can make a huge impact on developing and sustaining family school partnerships in your LEA. At this time, I'd just like to reach out again and ask um, those to enter something in the chat that you think, one takeaway from today, what's one thing that you can do um, and commit to that's easy uh, to implement as you move forward with, with the information, either from today or from day one? What's something you're gonna do, implement in your LEA? Okay, the first one I see student-led IEP meetings. Yes, it's great for students at any age. You can start, even in those, um, those are attending from early intervention, you can pull your students in as young 
as they are in early intervention and have them uh, participate in meetings. Okay, things are coming in fast. Um, meet parents and community if my supervisor allows. It. Yes, that is something that um, when working with uh, school teams in the past, we found that some of our schools, one of our schools in particular was going to, it was either the Walgreens or local CVS and they had a community room and they would offer, you know, they, they offered that room, of, made it available for the school and the school was able to have some um, parent trainings and some meetings for parents in the location, right in the community. And the location even offered um, all those who came and participated a $5 gift card for their store. So that was something new that I you know, had heard of a few years ago. And I think it, you know some of these things may be difficult right now with COVID and the restrictions, but those restrictions are lifting and there may be um, things that you can reach out to your community and access to help you, you know, meeting with your parents. Um, discuss student-led IEP meetings again, and increasing the involvement of students in your meetings. I like that. I think that that's so important. It's good for the, it's good for all stakeholders. It's good for the students. It's good, great for the families. Um, to hear information from their child. And it's really good in helping to um, build those relationships with families. Someone also said other language posted to our website. Yes, great. You know, know your, you know your community. You know what languages are spoken by the families you know, living close to you. And it's important to, to remember that and to try and to accommodate and provide those resources in as many languages as you can. We have more people that want to establish student-led IEP meetings. That's great. Involving students in the IFSP, yes, for our younger students. Someone stated their first priority is to develop rapport with students and meet parents face-to-face -face individually. Yes, there are many ways that you can do that. And that's a great goal. And it's very good to implement as soon as you can. Family engagement opportunities via the district's website. Amb ambassadors empowering students, meet parents where they are, support parents in, into leadership. Yes, um, I've heard from other schools in the past where they have you know, family liaisons, where they will pair families coming into the school um, with parents that are already established and have multiple children in the school and to help them along the way. Um, they might know what it, what it felt like to be the new student. Um, and it was great reflecting back on the video that we shared today, what was happening in the school district, getting those students there, you know, um, active and in, 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 you know, meeting and greeting new families as they come into the school district. So those are all really good ideas. And I hope that everyone has at least one takeaway that they're able to run with right away um, in your, in your you know, school or LEA. And um, I, I think that's, I think it's awesome. And it starts just with one step, one foot in front of the other and making a small change and then hoping to move from there. Okay, we just have a, a reference slide at the end of our, our PowerPoint. And now I'd just like to share, uh, we do have a survey that we'd like you to complete. Um, it is very brief. It should only take you a few minutes. You can access it if someone would please put the link in the chat or with the QR code, it's very quick and it's something that is easily done on your phone. If you have that handy, um, you will need to complete this BRAC 48 credit. And in just a moment, I will share on the next slide um, the link for um, the, those who are attending through the accelerated learning platform. Um, I will have that information for you in just a minute. Okay, and on this slide here, you'll see that information. The exit code for this session is 25941. Again, that's 25941. And you can access the survey via the QR code or the link. And lastly, here is our information. All the presenters are listed here and our email addresses. So please, if you have any family engagement needs, um, please reach out. We're happy to help. 
and um, just shoot us an email. <laughs>